My father was in a different way, uh, inspiring, uh, in a tough way. He was very tough on me, I must say. I, was, I have four uh, sisters, one brother. Uh, you know, nobody got the beatings that I got from my father because he thought that I will be the savior of this family and I'm the second man in a patriarchal structure, you know, a patrilineal structure of society, you know, a family where, you know, as you know, the father is the patriarch, then comes his right hand, is the, is the male, his son. My mother comes third. Although, in the end, my mother was the decision maker. My mother was a great inspiration to me because she did not have the opportunity of going to school and finishing school. But she always craved for education. So she had high hopes in me since I was a kid. And, she, you know, she went like the first six grades. And she taught me the French calligraphy, how to write the letters. She was so artistic. And she is political genius. You tell me how she watches the news and, and she had perceptions and she had a vision about the Palestinian issues that I personally, with my PhD, I could not really challenge her views and she was always right. Many times when I give talks, people sometimes, you know, get baffled by the fact that here is a guy with a strange name representing Palestine. So I always, you know, tell them, uh, that's true. I am Armenian by ethnic origin because of my name, Manuel Hassassian. And I'm Christian by religion. And I'm Catholic by denomination. That's how I was brought up. I am Palestinian by birth and citizenship. I'm Arab by nationality and a Muslim by civilization. My childhood was a very happy childhood. I always sometimes sit and tell my colleagues, I wish there is the time tunnel where I can go back only for one day when I was at the age of 16 and do the routine of that day where I have to eat breakfast in the morning, I live in the old city of Jerusalem, walk to the Freres College where I went for my high school, and then at 12 go back, eat, and then after classes start playing basketball and then table tennis, and then eventually we meet boys in the band and go around strolling in the seas of Jerusalem, and I used to end up at 9 o'clock at home, going back and, and studying. It was a beautiful childhood for me. We used to chase the girls, you know, at that age, 15, 16, go to their schools and what. Your childhood was obviously with a nation that are under occupation. I mean, how did that affect you? What has it left scars on you personally, in your memories, in your thoughts? After 1975, with the land day, I think hell broke loose in Palestine. People started feeling the, the, the ulterior motives of occupation and what have you. And resistance started, you know, at best. And as you know, the PLO became much more proactive after the 1967 war, you know, when Israel occupied the rest of Palestine. So, yes, it left, uh, it left certain scars. And I always looked at the Israelis as my enemy until I came back from the States and almost till the first intifada I opened up to dialogue and to debate with Israelis. But before that, I must tell you that, you know, I had uh, no feelings, I had uh, no respect, I had anger, I had, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at them as occupiers that uh, who are constantly demonizing us, you know, looking down at us and whatever. So I wanted to be on par with them when I decided to debate. And it started by debating a book on the Intifada written by Zaif Shif and Yehudi Ari, most distinguished journalists in Israel. They wrote a book on the Intifada in 1988. So I had to challenge them at the Hebrew University with almost 300 scholars and uh, people coming from the intelligence service and this and that, you know. And that was my debut, I would say, in, open, in opening up to Israeli society. And it started with Israeli academia. How do you feel knowing that you're the only ambassador in the world whose people are under occupation? It feels very funny, but it feels also hopeful that the idea of self-determination is going to be implemented whether Israel likes it or not. And the international community has already acknowledged 
our presence as nationhood, have acknowledged the state of Palestine, have acknowledged that there is a government, there is a geography, there is a culture, there is a history, there is a religion for the Palestinian people. Unlike what Israel has been, using it as a propaganda that the Palestinians have no origin in Palestine, it's a land for a people, for a people without a land, uh, to justify the Jewish alia immigration to Palestine because it's based on the biblical prophecies, as if God is a real estate agent where he could give certain people a certain land and, and, and then we cannot acquiesce it as ours. Although my house was demolished in 2002 with a tow missile, uh, they hit my, my I, luckily, you know, I, my family and I, we survived, I mean, uh, this storm missile because it came at the other end of the house, but it was totally destroyed. We survived death, and I became more resolute even then that there will never be a military solution to this conflict. If I'm asked today, and you as a journalist, you tell me, where do we stand in this peace process? I tell you, we, Palestinians and Israelis, are stuck between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible. What does the future hold for Palestinians? In the long run, I'm optimistic. Because we cannot continue to be under occupation. Palestinians cannot continue to be divided between Hamas and Fatah. The Muslim world cannot sit idle to see Israel desecrating our religious holy sites the Christians cannot tolerate the, 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 the Israelis controlling the holy sites in Jerusalem. And America is not going to be the unipolar power unequivocally supporting the state of Israel. Europe cannot continue to be subservient to the foreign agenda of the United States in the Middle East. And I cannot see the Israelis not being divided on where to go from here because they reached a stage where racism and ethnic cleansing is the name of the game and this is this is planting the seeds of their own destruction i want just to be a normal humble human being who would be remembered that i worked for palestine i committed myself in the area of education for almost and until now i still teach in summer when i take my vacation at the university of maryland college park when I left and became ambassador, I served my country in the realm of higher education for 25 years. I'm so proud that I have so many graduates now who are, you know, assuming the higher echelons of our society. That's my contribution. My legacy is already printed at Bethlehem University with the whole building named after myself, the Hassassian Student Development Center. And all I tell my kids, I'm not rich and I will never be rich because a humble academic cannot be rich. But I will leave a legacy of a clean man, a man who has not been corrupted, will, ne will fight nepotism and just left a record of commitment, nationalism to our country and have worked all my life towards peace, towards conflict resolution, towards conviviality, towards coexistence with the other side.